Okay, thanks everyone. So, uh, so this is about Superman, all right? And hopefully you can all see uh, Christopher Reeve on your screen, all right? And let's see. Okay, so Superman is one of the most famous fictional characters in the world. Uh, his comic books and the movies have been translated to languages, to many different languages. So everyone around the world knows about Superman. And the history of Superman begins in Toronto, right? And this is Joe Schuster, the artist who created Superman. And Joe Schuster was born in uh, Toronto and his parents were immigrants. Uh, they were both Jewish immigrants from Europe. His father was from Rotterdam, Netherlands, and the mother was from Kiev, Ukraine. And some of you may remember his first cousin, uh, Frank Schuster of the comedy team, Wayne and Schuster. So uh, Joe Schuster was born and grew up partly in Toronto. Uh, the 60 cent definitive stamp is officially called the Ontario street scene stamp, but it's really based on a Toronto scene, right? And on the official first day cover that Canada Post put up, the cache shows Toronto City Hall. So this is a Toronto scene. Now, when Joe Schuster was a young boy, he delivered newspapers for the Toronto Daily Star, the newspaper that we now know as the Toronto Star. And in my Superman exhibit, I had this um, American stamp to symbolize the newspaper boys. Now, this is a typical US stamp of the 1950s and even up to the 1970s. Uh, the United States Post Office Department uh, often used its stamps for propaganda purposes. Uh, the Soviet Union wasn't the only country issuing propaganda stamps back then. So let's take a look at this stamp. Um, here's the newspaper carrier boy. And on his bag, there's a slogan, busy boys, better boys. Now, in the 1950s, there were a lot of parents concerned that uh, rock and roll and comic books would turn their children into juvenile delinquents and later criminals, right? So, and, and, and remember, this was the era of movies like Rebel Without Ca a Cause or Reform School Girl, right? So, so th this stamp promotes the idea that if you keep your kids busy, uh, they'll grow up to be a good outstanding citizens. And then look at this hand holding a torch. The torch says free enterprise on it. So it's promoting the idea of capitalism, right? And in the center, there's yet another slogan. In recognition of the important service rendered their communities and their nation by America's newspaper boys. So in the pre-internet era, and still today, the newspapers were an important form of mass communications. So the theme of this stamp is that paper boys participate in the capitalist system so they can deliver newspapers to you so you can read how to prevent your children from becoming juvenile delinquents. Right? So very typical of an American stamp of the 1950s and 60s. Okay. Now I mentioned that Joe Schuster uh, delivered newspapers of Toronto Star. And this is a 1930s postcard of the original Toronto Star building. This is not the current Toronto Star building at 1 Young Street in downtown Toronto. Uh, this is the original one that existed in the 1930s and it was torn down in 1972 and first Canadian place was built on the location, right? So it's, 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 it's on Bay Street. Uh, now in the Superman comics, the Daily Planet building is based on the old Toronto Star building. So, uh, and on the left is a Canadian stamp showing Superman flying over the Daily Planet building. And there's the iconic Daily Planet building with the Daily Planet globe added to the top of the building. And you will see that type of design of building in all the Superman comic books and movies and cartoons. When he was about nine or 10 years old, uh, Joe Schuster and his family moved to Cleveland, Ohio. And there, uh, 
in high school, he met another uh, kid, Jerry Siegel, also the uh, son of Jewish immigrants. His parents came from Lithuania. They, they fled Lithuania to escape uh, yet another anti-Jewish pogrom. Right? And the two of them were interested in comic books, uh, science fiction, and art. So they quickly became friends. Right? It's a friendship that lasted into their adult lives. Uh, when World War II broke out, uh, Jerry Siegel joined the U.S. Army and he became a writer for the U.S. military newspaper Stars and Stripes. And he trained at uh, Fort George G. Meade in Maryland. So here is a patriotic cover from Fort George G. Meade. Uh, the postmark is actually from the fort post office itself. And that shape of cancellation, which the serious philatelists call the ovate bar numerical duplex hand cancel, but is more colloquially known as the football cancel, is very typical of American post office of the 1920s and 30s and even up to the 40s. Right? Right? And the numeral in the center, uh, depending on which city you're in, it was either a number assigned to a postal clerk, and each postal clerk had his own hand stamp, or it could have been the station or substation of that city's post offices. Okay, so that's very much a, a typical American patriotic cover. Now, in 1933, uh, Joe Schuster and Jerry Siegel collaborated to write and illustrate a science fiction story which they called the Reign of the Superman. And it was published in a fanzine or amateur magazine called Science Fiction. Right? And the Reign of the Superman was about a, a villainous character who had superpowers and his attempt to take over the world. And here is the Superman, you know, a bald, evil character. Now, over the next five years, they would reimagine and rewrite the Reign of the Superman and convert their hero, their, their, their main character, from a villain to a hero. But the idea of the bald villain stayed in the Superman comics and movies and cartoons as Lex Luthor, uh, Superman's arch villain. Then in 1938, uh, Schuster and Siegel succeeded in getting uh, national periodical publications one of the companies that would later combine with other companies and form DC Comics to buy their idea of a superhero wearing uh, blue tights and a cape, right? And you know, the, the, the outfit's based on the type of outfit that circus acrobats wore at the time. And, and uh, the story about Superman was published in Action Comics issue number one. And uh, Superman was the first modern comic book hero. And this comic book, Action Comics number one, is regarded by comic book collectors as the start of the golden age of comics. It's the most revered and most valuable comic book in the world. The last time an issue was sold at auction in 2014, it sold for over $3.2 million. Right? I do not have an, a copy of Action Comics number one but I do have the 1974 color reprint. And uh, Superman was immediately popular in that new medium of mass communications, the comic book. Right? He was so popular and had such an impact on American pop culture and American culture around the world that Super, the United States Postal Service chose Superman as one of its themes for its Celebrate the Century series of stamps that was issued close to the millennium, right? And this is the first day cover for the Superman Celebrate the Century stamp. Uh, you'll see that the first day of issue city for the 1930 stamps in the Celebrate the Century series is, was Cleveland, Ohio the city where Joe Schuster met Jerry Siegel, right? And this is a pictorial cancel, right? Uh, the cachet comes from the Postal Commemorative Society. That was one of those companies that sold 
first aid covers by subscription in the 1970s and 80s and 90s. And if the um, art style of the cache looks similar to art craft, that's because the Postal Commemorative Society outsourced its uh, cache design and printing to art craft. Uh, Interesting enough, I found out that the uh, Postal Commemorative Society still exists as a coin dealer called TCS Coins and Stamps. Although despite the name of the company, the majority of its products are, are coins now. Right? So uh, what makes a modern comic book hero? Superman wasn't the first hero in comic books. And he wasn't the first character with superpowers but it was the character that defined the archetype of the comic book hero. Well, the, the modern comic book hero has a distinctive costume, which Superman has, and he has a superpower. In Superman's case, more than one superpower. Now, I know people have told me that Batman doesn't have a superpower, but Batman compensates for it by being fabulously wealthy and being able to buy all the get neat gadgets like the like the utility belt, the bat batarang, and the batmobile, right? And another aspect of the modern comic book hero is that he or she has a secret identity, right? So Superman's secret identity is Clark Kent, mild-mannered reporter for the newspaper, The Daily Planet. Oh, by the way, I, I'll also add that in the early Superman stories, The Daily Planet was called The Daily Star. So it was obviously named after the Toronto Star, but as time went on, the publishers changed the name of Daily Planet. Now, what else makes a modern comic book superhero? Well, the altruistic mission. See, Superman and all these other comic book heroes, they have a, a mission to do good for society. In Superman's case, he fights for truth, justice, and the American way. And that's what made Superman or Clark Kent appealing to American readers in the 1930s. See, uh, there have been characters in folklore and fiction with superheroes for centuries. Uh, think of Gilgamesh, think of Hercules, King Arthur, and Merlin, and Siegfried, right? But all these other superheroes tended to use their superpowers to either maintain their position on their throne and maintain their power over their empires or countries, or they use them for adventure, right? Hercules is a good example. Uh, but Superman was different. He didn't want to be a king or emperor, and he didn't want a high position in society. He just wanted to be an ordinary person and a reporter working for a newspaper, right? And uh, he, he wanted to be Clark Kent most of the time. So Superman was really, became a symbol of the ordinary person who can do great things. And to American audiences coming out of the Great Depression and fearful that they might have to go into World War II, he became a very powerful symbol of what they wanted to be, the ordinary person who can do great things in a crisis. Right? And over the decades, uh, artists have used them to symbolize the ordinary person who does extraordinary things in a crisis. Uh, this is a picture by Alex Roth of Superman at 9-11. And you can see here that it's Superman who reveres the ordinary people who helped out others at 9-11. And this is a more recent picture by the editorial cartoonist Malcolm Mays from the Edmonton Journal showing Superman giving the symbols of his superpower or superhero status, the red cape and the Superman logo, or the symbol of the House of L to a healthcare worker during the COVID crisis. Another reason why Superman was very popular was that he tapped into various archetypes uh, that exist in our society, you know, things that we already know about. And there was, there's a lot of references to Jewish religion in the Superman story. Um, he comes from the Kryptonian House of El. That's the name of his clan. But the word El is derived from the Hebrew word uh, Elohim. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. 
which means of the gods. And the S-shaped logo that he wears uh, originally started out as the letter S, but over time in the comic books, it became known as being the logo or clan symbol of the House of L, right? And this is a postmark from Naples, Italy from 2018 for the 80th anniversary of Superman showing the symbol of the House of L, right? Uh, the other Jewish religious influence in the Superman story is the Moses story. Uh, both men uh, were set adrift by their parents, hoping, to rest, hoping they would be saved by a catastrophe. Both of them uh, were adopted by another family, and both of them later came back to become uh, saviors or heroes to, to the people. Right? Uh, this is a souvenir sheet from the African kingdom of Lesotho, showing Moses. Uh, what's interesting is that this sh souvenir sheet is the Easter issue, uh, which is interesting because I always associated Easter with the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, and not with anything to do with Moses. It's actually Passover, which is Moses's festival. Uh, the only connection to Mo of Moses to Easter I can think of is that the Last Supper of Jesus might have been a Passover dinner, uh, but that's it. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, Lesotho put Moses on an Easter stamp. And there it is. Another reason why Superman was popular with American readers was that he symbolized the immigrant's success story. Uh, he's an immigrant, indeed a refugee, from the planet Krypton. Uh, he lands in Kansas. Uh, gets assimilated into American society and becomes a hero to the Americans. So he very much represents the immigrant success story. This is one of those covers that were made by companies that sold covers by subscription in the 1970s and 80s and 90s. It's from Fleetwood, which is a, still a first day cover company. And Fleetwood had a series of covers commemorating events of American history. And this one's for the 93rd anniversary of the first immigrants to Ellis Island. The cachet art is by Mark Kunstler, who was famous for his paintings of scenes from American history. Uh, it's quite likely that both Joe Schuster's and uh, Jerry Siegel's parents passed through Ellis Island as they came into America. Now, what's interesting about Superman is that he wasn't the first immigrant to be a comic book character, but before Superman, uh, comic book characters were either villains or they were comic relief characters. They were seldom heroes. Okay. Now here's another cover that really shows Superman as being the immigrant success story. Uh, this is for the, one of the Canadian stamps issued in 2013 for Superman's 75th anniversary. The cover is by Wonderful World of Stamps. That's the uh, stamp to Isidore Bob of Montreal, right? And uh, there's, it shows Christopher Reeve from the uh, Superman movies. And the cancel is the Toronto, Ontario, pictorial first day cancel for that issue, right? And you can see it has the House of L symbol on it. So let's look at the fictional history of Superman. Well, Superman is from the planet Krypton, and he's the son of Jor-El, one of Krypton's most famous scientists, and his wife, Lara. And for years, Jor-El has been warning the Kryptonian scientists that their planet is, a, is going to explode in the future, and that their best bet for the survival of their people is to build a fleet of spaceships and to evacuate everyone off the planet. But they don't listen to him. Unfortunately, Jor-El is correct. The planet starts to vibrate and it's going to explode. Uh, Jor-El, though, has managed to build a single-seater spaceship, and he and Lara put their baby Cal-El aboard it and launch him towards Earth. You know, because Earth uh, has, you know, a relatively advanced civilization, not as civilized as Krypton's, of course, uh, their people resemble the Kryptonians, and uh, because Earth has a yellow sun, 
the radiation of the yellow sun gives Kryptonians superpowers. So he'll be assured of having good health in his life on Earth. So uh, Superman is launched towards Earth. Now, there's a town in Kansas called Hutchinson. And every year in June, they hold a comic book convention. And the town council renames the, the town Smallville in honor of the town in Kansas where Superman grew up, right? And in 2015, the local post office had a pictorial cancel for the Smallville Comic Con. And the cancel shows the spaceship that Kal-El takes to go to Earth in the 1978 Superman movie. Right. So when the Kal-El lands on Earth, uh, a passing couple, uh, Jonathan and Martha Kent, discover the spaceship and adopt the baby, uh, name him Clark, and so he grows up with the name Clark Kent, and he grows up being a farm boy in Kansas, in the town of Smallville. And this is a scene from the TV show Smallville, showing teenage Clark Kent with his high school uh, girlfriend, Lana Lang, sitting on a windmill. And Kansas has lots of windmills. So in 2011, when the United States Postal Service issued a stamp commemorating the 150th anniversary of Kansas statehood, it showed a windmill on the stamp. Well, when uh, Clark Kent grows up, he moves to the big city of Metropolis, which looks a lot like the fun part of Manhattan and becomes a newspaper reporter for the Daily Planet newspaper. Now, in 2006, the United States Postal Service issued a paint of stamps depicting the superheroes of DC Comics. Right? Uh, the first day of issue was July 21st, and postmasters across the United States could order their own cancellations for this issue of stamps, right? And many did. Um, now, I had previously presented this presentation to the Philatelic Specialist Society of Canada, but I have new information since that uh, presentation. Uh, is that uh, 20, 19 cities across the United States took advantage of getting DC superhero cancellations made. And uh, these 19 cities account for 28 different cancels. Some of them had more than one cancel. Right? And this is one of the Superman cancels. You see Superman flying over Metropolis, and there is the iconic Daily Planet building with the Daily Planet globe on top of it. This particular cancel comes from Kodiak, Alaska, where there was a comic book convention going on that weekend, uh, the fifth annual Kodiak Comic Con. Right? Now, of the uh, 28 cancels, by far, Superman was the most popular character on those cancels. Uh, 15 of those cancels show Superman, uh, four of them show Batman, four show The Flash, three show Wonder Woman, and unfortunately Green Lantern only shows up on two of the cancels. Right. Now, in Metropolis, Superman meets the love of his life, Lois Lane, another reporter for the Daily Planet. Right? And in the comic books, Lois Lane is the winner of the Pulitzer Prize for journalism. There is no U.S. stamp commemorating the Pulitzer Prize directly, but there's a U.S. stamp commemorating Joseph Pulitzer. And there it is. And the freedom of the press stamp, I put in an exhibit to represent Lois Lane's profession in journalism. Okay. Now, in the 1950s, comic book public editors and writers thought it would be more interesting if Superman was not the sole survivor of the planet Krypton. So in the 50s and 60s, they began to introduce other people who survived the explosion of Krypton. Uh, by the 1970s, there was a joke that everyone, everyone had actually survived the explosion of Krypton. Now, the most notable of the survivors of Krypton other than Superman, uh, is Supergirl. This is his cousin from Argo City. In the comic books, when Krypton explodes, 
there's not a chunk of it large enough to hold an entire city. And depending on which version of the story you read, Argo City either had a plastic dome over it or it escaped with an air pocket, right? So everyone on that city was saved. However, over time, radiation from beneath the surface made Argo City uninhabitable. So um, Zorel, Jorel's brother, puts his teenage daughter, uh, Kara, aboard yet another single seater spaceship and launches her towards Earth. And when Kara arrives on Earth, she meets Superman, uh, adopts the identity of Supergirl, and becomes a superhero in her own right. And uh, because all superheroes have to have a secret identity, uh, the teenage Supergirl gets adopted by the Danvers in Midvale, USA, and assumes the secret identity of Linda Lee Danvers. Now, Supergirl appears on stamps too. Uh, these are two stamps from the 2006 DC Superheroes Pain, or sheet of stamps. Uh, and here you see her on two of the stamps. You can see that Supergirl, unlike Superman, has changed her costume frequently over the decades. On the left is the original costume from the 1950s. It's really a skater dress version of Superman's costume. And on the right is the costume from the 1970s with the blue top and the red uh, short shorts or hot pants, which comic book collectors have nicknamed the cocktail waitress costume. Uh, the Postal Commemorative Society uh, made this particular cachet, and for some reason, they decided to put the most unpopular of all the Supergirl costumes on the cachet. Uh, it, this is the costume she wore in the early 1980s, briefly, in the comic books, it was during the time of the big aerobics trend, and the comic book artist put this headband on her forehead. Now, you may remember back then, um, Olivia Newton-John wearing that headband in her Let's Get Physical music video, right? Uh, unfortunately, that headband was so unpopular with comic book fans that the, the artist removed it after a few months. But the rest of the costume, uh, the blue top with the red skirt, became very popular and stayed as her costume for decades and was only replaced by another costume earlier this year. Now, Americans have a do-it-yourself culture in philately, right? Uh, Americans like to invent their own uh, ob covers and objects for themselves or for each other. Uh, Canadians and the Brits and Europeans don't do that to that as much to the same extent. Uh, we typically like to collect, you know, real serious postal history objects that went through the mail uh, to fulfill a real correspondence demand or for a business purpose, right? But Americans like to create commemorative covers and first day covers on their own. So when I was in New York, I decided to, uh, to you know, practice that old saying, uh, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. So I created this commemorative cover for, or event cover, to celebrate the Adventures of Superman radio series, which ran from 1940 to 1951. It was broadcast out of New York. It starred uh, Bud Collier as Superman, Joan Alexander as Lois Lane, and Jackson Beck as the announcer. Right? And I took it to the Bryant Station in New York. That's a post office near uh, Times Square. And got it hand canceled and sent through the mail to a friend of mine uh, who, who then sent it over to me. Okay. Well, it was the Adventure Superman radio series that created that famous introduction that many people know. Uh, up in the sky, look, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's Superman. And that introduction would carry forward into the cartoons and comic books as well. Superman made his first appearance in movies in a series of animated films made by Max Fleischer and Paramount Studios between 1941 and 1943. And uh, these short animated films were very influential. Their art style influences 
animation up to this day. You know, the Batman animated series in the 1990s has a style very similar to the 1940s Superman cartoons. And I made this first day cover using an uncached Hanukkah first day cover from 2018 and uh, designed my own cache showing Max Fleischer and Superman. I made it on Photoshop and printed it onto the uncached first day cover. The United States Postal Service sells uncached first day covers and this has been quite a uh, benefit for first day cover collectors and makers. They can now buy the uncached cover and print their own caches onto them. Again, this is another a part of the do-it-yourself culture amongst American stamp collectors. Now, Max Fleischer was a Polish Jewish immigrant who came to the United States and entered the film industry. It's amazing how much of Superman's early history was created by, you know, Jewish guys. And uh, Max Fleischer is most famous for inventing the rotoscope. That's a device where you can uh, take motion pictures or films of real human beings and then trace their movements onto an animated film, right? And he used a rotoscope, he's most famous for that. Now, I decided to use the Hanukkah first day cover uh, as the cover to honor Max Fleischer uh, because Max Fleischer was Jewish and these holiday stamps of the United States often serve a double purpose. Not only do they celebrate religious holidays, but some of them also celebrate ethnic groups as well, like the Sanco de Mayo stamp and the Kwanzaa stamp. So I thought it'd be appropriate to uh, celebrate Max Fleischer on the Hanukkah stamp, uh, first day cover. Now the Max Fleischer films uh, introduced another famous introduction for a hero. Faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, able to leap tall buildings in single bound. This amazing stranger from the planet Krypton, the Man of Steel, Superman. The Fleischer films also had another major influence on Superman. It was in the Fleischer animated films where Superman began to fly. In the comic books up until this time, he jumped a lot. He could jump over buildings and he could jump from city block to city block. Uh, but when Fleischer put that into the animated films, it looked rather silly, right? Superman would just jump over buildings. Uh, he thought it'd be more dramatic if Superman could fly. So Superman began to fly in the animated films, and then the comic books and subsequent cartoons and movies showed Superman flying. Uh, in 1948, Kirk Allen became the first actor to portray Superman in live action films in a serial called Superman and later in another serial called Adam Man vs. Superman. Uh, some of you may remember what serials are and some of you might be too young for them, but serials were short films that were shown in the movie theater every week, right? And uh, each chapter of the serial was an individual chapter of a longer story. So typically people went to see uh, a feature film and a newsreel and a chapter of a serial in the theater one week. And then when they went back to the theater the next week, they saw another movie plus the next chapter of the serial. And over uh, some, usually 12 weeks, these, they would see all 12 chapters of the serial, right? Now, uh, this cover is for the 20th anniversary of the death of Kirk Allen, and you see it has a mailer's postmark permit uh, cancel. Uh, the do-it-yourself culture in American philology even extends to stamp collectors creating their own cancellations or postmarks. In the United States, it's possible to get a permit from your local postmaster to cancel your own mail and create your own cancel or postmark to cancel your mail. This began as a way for uh, companies with a lot of mail to cancel their own mail before taking to the post office. So that would save time. Uh, and instead of having the postal clerk uh, cancel each individual uh, mailing or catalog being sent out, 
uh, it could just go into the mail stream right away. And therefore that company's mail to its customers and mailing list could go out faster. But of course, stamp collectors discovered the concept of the mailer's postmark permit, and they began applying for permits so they could make their own first day covers and event covers. Okay. Uh, you don't have to live in a particular city to get a mailer's postmark permit from that city's postmaster. What you really need is for that postmaster to actually know what a mailer's postmark permit is, because that's one of the more obscure sections of the postal manual, and a lot of postmasters don't know what it is. Right? So uh, I decided, I thought that, well, let's see if I can apply for a mailer's postmark permit from the post office in downtown Los Angeles, because I visit Los Angeles once a year for a science fiction convention. And I applied for one from post office zip code 90052. And much to my surprise, I got an email from the postmaster's assistant saying that I was approved for a post mailer's postmark permit. So uh, I could actually make my own cancellation and start casting my own mail. Right? So here's one of my covers. I wasn't so lucky with the Kennedy Space Center post office, though. I might actually be one of the few, if not only Canadians, to get a mailer's postmark permit from the Los Angeles Post Office. Well, this cover shows Noel O'Neill, who was the first actress to play Lois Lane. She played Lois Lane in the Kirk Allen Superman series, and then she came back to play Lois Lane in the TV series, The Adventures of Superman. Okay. Now, this is another example of do-it-yourself philately of the United States. If you talk to American first day cover collectors, and there's a lot of first day cover collectors of the United States, you might hear the term paste up cover or paste on cover, right? A paste on cover is a cover where the cache is printed on a piece of paper, cut out and pasted onto the cover. So I had an uncached or undecorated Greetings from Minnesota stamp, the first day cover, right? And I, th I realized that No O'Neill was born in Minnesota. So I designed a cache showing No, no O'Neill, native of Minnesota, and I printed it on a piece of paper, cut it out, and pasted it onto the first day cover. So that's an example of a paste on cache. The next actor to play Superman was George Reeves in The Adventures of Superman. This first time on television, first time Superman was on television, and this series ran in the 1950s. For a lot of us, he's our first Superman. Now, George Reeves, uh, before he played Superman, he played one of the Tarleton twins, Stuart Tarleton, the two boys who pester Scarlett O'Hara in the first scene of Gone with the Wind. Right, you remember the two guys who were pestering Scarlet to go to the barbecue with them? Right? He was one of those guys. Right? And Gone with the Wind is commemorated on the U.S. stamp. Uh, this is a stamp from 1990, part of a block of four stamps commemorating the great movies of 1939. Of all the actors who have played Superman, George Reeves has the closest connection to stamps and philately. And that's because he played Superman in the short film called Stamp Day for Superman in 1954. Uh, in this movie, a uh, short film, Superman encourages children to buy U.S. Department of the Treasury saving stamps from the U.S. Post Office. Now, you might be wondering, what are Treasury saving stamps? Well, here are Treasury saving stamps from the 1950s. And similar stamps existed during World War I and World War II. Now, uh, let's say you wanted a U.S. savings bond, but you did not have enough money to buy a savings bond all at once. But you could save money every week and accumulate enough money to buy a savings bond. Well, uh, what happened was, if you could do that, you got a folder from the post office or the Department of the Treasury, and every week, or whenever you could, you bought a saving stamp, right? So they came in denominations from 10 cents to $1. Okay. 
So let's say you bought a $1 saving stamp one week, and then next week you bought another $1 saving stamp. You would then paste these stamps into the folder. When you had accumulated 10 stamps in the folder, you could go to the post office or the treasury and exchange that folder for a $10 US savings bond. Right? So that's what saving stamps were sold for. Right? So uh, children were encouraged to buy these too as a way for them to learn how to save money and also for a way to, for them to lend money to the United States government. So Superman actually encouraged children to lend money to the United States government while also saving money at the same time. Uh, the next actor to play Superman in a major production, you know, not counting things like Broadway plays, uh, was Christopher Reeve. Right? And in 1978, he starred in Superman, which is arguably the first modern comic book movie. It was made for an audience of that not, not just for children, but also included adults as well. It had a high budget. It had a few stars like Marlon Brando and Gene Hackman in it, right? And uh, the, although today people associate the big budget blockbuster superhero movie with the Marvel Comics movies like The Avengers and Thor and Captain America, it was actually the competition, Warner Brothers and DC that made the first modern comic book superhero movie, right? And it was Superman. And here's another first day cover by Isidore Baum in Montreal showing George Reeves I mean, George Reeve as Superman, and it has one of the Canadian stamps and the Toronto First Day cancellation. Now, there's a Canadian connection to one of these Superman movies, to, to these Superman movies. Uh, Kansas was not played by Kansas. The Kansas scenes were shot in Alberta, and in the middle, is a scene from the Superman movie of 1978 showing Clark Kent racing a train through a Kansas wheat field. And this suit is almost entirely duplicated in the rural America issue of 1974 showing its train driving through a Kansas wheat field. And on the right is a Canadian stamp showing the Alberta wheat field. There's another Canadian connection to these Superman movies and that's Margot Kidder, the Canadian actress who played Lois Lane. Margot Kidder came from Yellowknife, the uh, city commemorated on this 1984 Canadian stamp. And on the right is a photograph of Margot Kidder when I saw her at the Motor City Comic Con in 2004. Motor City Comic Con is held in a town near Detroit, Michigan. The Canadian connections to Superman continue to this day. There was a TV series called Smallville, which ran for a decade from 2001 to 2011. And it was about teenage Clark Kent growing up in Smallville, Kansas. And Smallville was filmed in Vancouver. This time it was Vancouver and surrounding areas filling in as Kansas. And many of you are familiar with this Canadian $1 definitive stamp from 1973 showing Vancouver. Now in Smallville, Lex Luthor, Superman's arch enemy, gets elected president of the United States. In, in, in Smallville's universe, there's a presidential election in 2018, which means that Lex Luthor is inaugurated as president on January 20, 2019. So for fun, I made this inauguration cover for Lex Luthor, president of the United States, right, and got uh, Michael Rosenbaum, the actor who plays Lex Luthor, to autograph it at Fan Expo Canada, a big comic book convention in Toronto last year. Uh, some of you may be wondering what's an inauguration cover. The Americans have a custom of making commemorative covers for the inauguration of each of their new presidents or for the second term inauguration of an incumbent president. The Canadian connection to Superman continues to this day. Supergirl has her own TV series, which began in 2015, and that's filmed in Vancouver as well. So on the left is uh, Melissa Benoist 
as Supergirl. And on the right is another Canadian stamp showing Vancouver. This one for the 125th anniversary of British Columbia. There's a town in Illinois called Metropolis. And every year in June, Metropolis holds a Superman celebration, right? Uh, despite its name of Metropolis, there's only 6,500 people living there, but they do hold a good Superman celebration. And for years, uh, the local post office has had a pictorial cancel for the Superman celebration. The earliest one I can find dates back to 1979. Now, the Superman celebration was first held in 1978. I don't know if there was a cancellation uh, in 1978. I'm going to have to find an old copy of the postal bulletin and see if it mentions anything about it. The last Superman celebration cancel listed in the United States Postal Service postal bulletin is from 2007, and there hasn't been one mentioned subsequently. So I think 2007 is the last year when there was a Superman celebration cancel. Uh, this is the 1979 Metropolis, Illinois Superman celebration cancel. And here are more cancellations from Metropolis, Illinois over the years. Okay. Well, those are cancellations. Now, the first time Superman appeared on a stamp was not a stamp issued by the United States, but by Canada. And he appears in a set of stamps issued in 1995 to commemorate Canadian comic book superheroes. I had never really thought of Superman being a Canadian comic book superhero. Um, he fights for truth, justice, and the American way. Uh, he lives in an American city. Uh, sure, Joe Schuster was Canadian, but he started drawing Superman after he had moved to Cleveland, Ohio. And the co-creator, Jerry Siegel, was always an American, always lived in the United States. But uh, according to Canada Post and the organization Historia Canada, Superman is one of our heroes. So hence, he shows up on a stamp commemorating Canadian comic book superheroes. The other superhero commemorator are Novana, uh, Queen of the Northern Lights, Captain Canuck, uh, Fleur de Lis from Quebec, and Johnny Canuck, the World War II Canadian comic book superhero. Now, these stamps were issued in a booklet of 10, and this is the cover of the booklet showing Superman drawn by Joe Schuster. And this is the first day cover of the, uh, of the issue. It's the official first day cover from Canada Post. And this particular example is autographed by Ron Sutton and Janet Hetherington, the designers of the first day cover. And it's also autographed in the center by Richard Conley, the creator of Captain Canuck. And here are Ron Sutton and Janet Hetherington, comic book artists and designers of the first day cover at Fan Expo Canada in 2017. I, I know them uh, because I've known them for years through the comic book and science fiction convention circuit. Janet's role with stamp collecting at Canada Post goes back for decades. In the 1990s, she used to edit a Canada Post publication for young stamp collectors. And her connections to Superman go back even further. This is a photograph from the Masquerade or costume competition of MapleCon, an Ottawa science fiction convention in 1986. And here in the corner, wearing the gold headdress and the purple robe, is Janet in costume as Lara, Superman's mother, from the comic book Man of Steel, which was published in 1986. And over here, in the white construction helmet and white lab coat is me in costume as a Soviet nuclear engineer from the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. It was big news back in 1986. Okay. Uh, Superman's next appearance on a stamp was in 1998 as part of the Celebrate the Century series from the United States Postal Service. I had previously shown a first day cover of that stamp 
uh, in Cleveland, Ohio was the official first day of issue city. But the postmaster of Metropolis, Illinois could not resist getting his own cancellation for this stamp. After all, Metropolis is Superman's city, so this is the cancel. It's not easy to find. I've only found one on the market in the last few years. And this first day cover was created by Pew Caches, uh, which was the late Julian Pew and his wife Sharon Pew from Woodlands, Texas. And the cache art was by Pa R. Stewart. Uh, Americans not only collect first day covers by their cancellation or postmark, they also collect them by the cover artist and the creator of the first day cover. There's a whole journal devoted to that, published by the American First Day Cover Society. Okay. Superman's next appearance on stamps was on this pane or sheet of stamps issued in 2006, the DC Superheroes issue, right? And Superman appears on two stamps. Here he is in the corner. Here he's down here. And there's his cousin, Supergirl, over here and down here. And you'll see the other DC Comics heroes on this set as well. Uh, the backing paper of these stamps had descriptions of superheroes. So here's the backing paper, right? These are commemorative stamps, right? I mean, self-adhesive stamps. Okay. Right. And here's the black and white first day of issue cancellation. You'll see that the city is San Diego, California. Of course, uh, this set of stamps was issued at the San Diego Comic Con, the largest comic book convention in North America, right? exceeded in size only by Comic K in Japan. And this is the digital color postmark or cancellation for that issue. Now, what's a digital color postmark or DCP? Starting in the 2000s, the United States began printing uh, color cancellations on its first day covers. These are laser printed onto the cover and they're produced at the stamp fulfillment service in Kansas City, uh, Missouri. The nickname for that part of the post office is called the caves because it's located in a bunch of underground caves beneath Kansas City, Missouri. So you hear an American collector refer to the caves. That's the stamp fulfillment off um, service. It's also where they send out the uh, orders that stamp collectors uh, send in, right? So the whole philatelic service operates out of a, a bunch of underground caves underneath Kansas City, Missouri, right? Uh, so many issues of the United States have both the color first day of issue cancellation and a black and white first day of issue cancellation. And Superman showed up on stamps again in 2013 in a series of items from Canada for Superman's 75th anniversary. Now on the surface, this looks like a simple issue of six designs, uh, a souvenir sheet, a booklet, and some postal cards. But it actually gets complicated when you look at the varieties of these items. Okay. So this is possibly the least complicated item in the issue. A souvenir sheet showing Superman over the, over the decades, right? So here's five stamps showing Superman by five different artists. And this is the first day cover of that souvenir sheet. Then there's the coil stamp. And the coil stamp shows, you know, the S logo underneath the shirt. It's based on a comic book cover. The comic book being Man of Steel, issue number one, John, drawn by John Byrne in 1986. If you bought this stamp or the coil at the post office, the backing paper, it was self-adhesive, uh, had Kryptonian writing on it. See the Kryptonian writing, right? Uh, there's actually a way to translate Kryptonian into English. And it translates to the S shield is more than Superman's family crest. It's a Kryptonian symbol that means hope. Uh, what the post, what Canada Post did not tell people was that if you bought the coil stamp 
in the uh, quarterly packs and the annual collections that it sells to stamp collectors. Um, there was no Canadian, there was no uh, Kryptonian writing on the backing paper. The backing paper was blank. So there's actually a backing paper variety on the coil stamp. And, it, and the, uh, the, the blank backing paper stamp has its own catalog number in the Unitrade Canadian catalog. Then there's the booklet. Now, on the surface, the booklet is pretty simple. It's got the five stamps with the same designs as in the souvenir sheet. And these are subhesive, unlike the souvenir sheet, so you just peel them off and stick them on the cover. Right? Uh, where it starts to get complicated is that there are five different covers for the booklet. Right? And although every booklet has the same combination and configuration of the five designs that comprise the 10 stamps of the booklet, each, in the, each design of the cover is correlated with a different configuration or combination of non-postal stickers at the bottom of the booklet. The Canada Post put these non-postal stickers, not valid for postage, in each booklet so you could decorate your covers. And each different, each of these five booklets has its own catalog number in the Unitrade catalog. So this is one of the booklets. Here's another two of the booklets and you can see that the non-postal stickers are different in each booklet. Uh, there are variations of the Daily Planet logo and the House of L logo. And here's another two booklets with different non-postal stickers with them. Right. Now let's look at the cancellations for the first day covers. Canada Post used this Toronto cancellation for the official first day covers of souvenir sheet. Uh, Canada Post did not make any first day covers for the booklet stamps, uh, but individual collectors and dealers could ask for this cancel on first day covers of the booklet stamps if they sent the covers to the National Philatelic Center. So some covers with the, of the booklet stamps do exist with this cancel. Now this is a cancellation that Canada Post used on the coil stamps. What's interesting about it is the city of the postmark is Metropolis. There is no city or town called Metropolis in Canada. Right? So Canada Post used a fictitious city or fictional city on its postmark. Uh, interestingly enough, this is not the first time Canada Post has done this. This is the second time that Canada Post has used a fictional city on a postmark. The first time was on 2008 for the first day covers of the Anne of Green Gables issue. And those first day covers had two postmarks on them. One was from the real life Cavendish Prince Edward Island. And the other one was from the fictional Avonlea Prince Edward Island where Green, Anne of Green Gables lives. Right? Um, I don't know if any other country in the world has postmarks for fictional cities that it uses on first day covers. Canada certainly does. Right, and here's the first day cover of the coil stamp autographed by Jack O'Halloran and Sarah Douglas, the actors who played the Kryptonian supervillains Nan and Ursa in the Christopher Reeve Superman movies. Canada also issued postal cards, uh, you know, prepaid post cards for the Superman 75th anniversary. Uh, again, on the surface, it looks pretty simple. There are five postage indicia, that is the stamp-like design in the upper right corner of the message side of the postcard, right, which denotes prepaid postage. But Canada had to issue 10 different images on the, uh, image side, right, or a picture side. So to get the complete connection, you really need 10 cards, not five cards, right? Now, five of those cards are called the, uh, the cover images cards because the 
picture side has a picture of a comic book cover, which has an image which is which was later used to uh, get the image for the posto indicium, right? So you see the posto indicium here is based on the comic book cover on the uh, on the picture side. Right? So this cards indicia shows uh, Superman is drawn by Joe Schuster on Superman issue number one from 1939. Right? And here's a postal card showing uh, Superman drawn by Kenneth Rocafort, right? So you can see the same Superman image from the comic book cover shows up in the postage in Decia, right? This particular example is autographed by Tyler Hoechlin, the actor who plays Superman in this TV series, Supergirl. Right? And then let's look at the uh, other cover image other cover image cards. Now, this is an interesting one. Um, this, the postal indicium shows Superman is drawn by Wayne Boring, but the picture or cover image um, isn't by Wayne Boring. It's a different comic book drawn by Joe Schuster. And this postal card's postal indicium shows Superman, you know, flying over the Daily Planet building, drawn by the artist Jim Lee. But instead of matching it to a comic book cover drawn by Jim Lee, the picture side shows the Man of Steel cover drawn by John, drawn by John Byrne, right? Which I thought was an unusual way to match the indicium to the, uh, to the picture side because Jim Lee does draw another one of the pictures that was used on, a, on the postal cards. And here it is. This is the Superman comic book cover drawn by Jim Lee. It's on the picture side of one of the postal cards, but it got matched to the uh, indicium drawn by Neil Adams, who's more famous for drawing Batman, but he also drew Superman as well. And this particular example is signed by Brandon Roth, the actor who plays Superman in the movie Superman Returns, right? Uh, Canada wasn't the only country to issue Superman stamps in 2013. That was also the year the movie Man of Steel came out. And in that movie, uh, an actor named Henry Cavill played Superman. Henry Cavill was originally from Jersey, one of the Channel Islands. So Jersey issued a set of stamps in honor of Man of Steel and Henry Cavill. Now, this set of stamps has a lot of gimmicks in it, right? Each stamp has a different gimmick. So the 45 pence value uh, can be scanned by your smartphone. And if you've got the app SmartC, you can watch an interview with Henry Cavill on your phone. I tried doing that recently, but uh, the SmartC app is no longer on the Apple iPhone store, so I can't watch the interview. Uh, now, the 55 pence stamp. Uh, it looks like it's got a white background, but that's actually the backing paper for it. It's a self-adhesive stamp. When you peel it off the backing paper, it's printed on transparent material. And that represents Superman's X-ray vision. The 60 pence stamp is printed on silver foil. Now, it's not easy to see on the scan, but it shows Henry Cavill's chest with the House of L, or Superman logo on it. Right? And the 68 pen stamp uh, is printed with thermochromatic ink, right? And when he is applied to the stamp, the earth appears above Superman, right? And the 80 pen stamp has got to be the most gimmicky of the entire, of the, of the entire issue. Um, the Jersey Post Office and the stamps printers asked Henry Cavill, what's your favorite place on Jersey? And he said it was Beauport Bay. So they got a pebble from Beauport Bay, crushed it, and put a microscopic particle of that pebble in each of the 80 pence stamps. And the 88 pence stamp has a glow in the dark message in green ink. So if you put it in a dark room, you will see this message from Jor-El, Superman's father. You will give the people an idea to strive towards. They will race behind you. They will stumble, they will fall, 
But in time, they will join you with the sun. In time, you will help them accomplish wonders. Jor-El. Unfortunately, I don't read that line as well as Russell Crowe does in the movie Man of Steel, but you get, and in the movie Man of Steel, but you get the idea. Okay. Now, there was also a souvenir sheet. Uh, it was one of those lenticular souvenir sheets where if you, if you hold it at an angle, you can see Superman flying, which is not easy to see on the scan. Okay. So here's the first day cover for the stamps. And here's the first day cover for the souvenir sheet. Australia also got into Superman stamps in 2016. It used its personalized stamp format to uh, make these stamps commemorating Action Comics, Superman's comic book. Uh, these are, calling these personalized stamps is actually a misnomer because in the Australian format, it's actually the label beside the stamp that gets personalized not the stamp itself, right? And uh, those, these were not ordered by any specific client. Uh, Australia's post office uh, produced them and sold them to collectors. Here's another one of the sheets from 2016 from Australia. In 2018, Australia made another sheet of personalized Superman stamps for the 80th anniversary of Superman. Now, Portugal is the latest country to issue Superman stamps. All throughout this year, Portugal has been issuing stamps depicting DC Comics characters. Uh, these include Superman, Wonder Woman, uh, The Flash, uh, Joker, and Harley Quinn, right, and Batman. And they've been issued at different times during the year. Uh, Portugal used its personalized stamps format for these stamps, too. In Portugal, the personalized stamps are issued in booklets of four, right? So this is the Superman stamps, right? Now, uh, when I last gave this presentation to the Philatelic uh, Specialist Society of Canada, PSSC, I mentioned that Portugal also issued a collector sheet for its DC Comics issues. I had not received the collector sheet from Portugal at the time yet. And looking at the Portuguese Postal Services website and its agent's website, it uses a foreign sales agent called WOPA, the World Online Philatelic Agency. Uh, I presume that the collector sheet was like the Royal Mail's collector sheet from Britain. In Britain, sometimes the Royal Mail will issue something called a collector sheet, which is a sheet of stamps that are gummed Right? And they sometimes have a whole bunch of Star Wars stamps on them, for example, right? and, uh, and they're issued for collectors, right? Because no one would really buy a collector sheet and you know, separate the stamps and put them on mail. So I presume that these Portuguese collector sheets were like the British collector sheets, actual stamps. Well, imagine my surprise when I got my shipment from the Portuguese post office and discovered that the collector sheets are not actually stamp panes, they're actually comic book posters with the stamps pasted onto them, right? So uh, they're great if you want a Superman poster or a Batman poster, but these are not items that are going to get a catalog number, despite its name, right? You know, whereas the British collector sheets, they're going to get a Gibbons catalog number because those are actual stamps, right? This is the first day cover for the Superman stamps from Portugal. Uh, for some reason, they're hard to get. Uh, WOPA, World Online Philatelic Agency, the sales agent, foreign sales agent for Portugal's post office told me that they were made in only limited numbers and WOPA didn't even get any to sell to foreign collectors. And when I tried to add them to my cart on the Portuguese post office's website, uh, it automatically showed up as sold out. And then in, in August, Portugal issued its Justice League issue showing six DC comic superheroes, Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, Flash, and Cyborg. And there was a souvenir sheet to accompany it as well. Now, let's take a look at fake or bogus Superman stamps. These are not forgeries because they don't uh, forge existing legitimate designs issued by a government. These are completely fictional designs. And here's one that 
is allegedly from Benin, a, uh, an African country. Uh, you can tell this one is not real because the, the wording at the top in English, Superman the movies with an apostrophe S is really quite meaningless. And here's another bogus or fake Superman souvenir sheet, allegedly from the Central African Republic. Now, I can't find this one on the Stamper Regia website, and it's not listed in Gibbons or uh, Scott catalog, although those two catalogs are years behind uh, schedule on listing stamps of the Central African Republic and several other African countries. Could be because the Central African Republic has an ongoing civil war, right? But uh, it is not listed on this website, uh, cer.poststamps.com, which is allegedly the official website of the Central African Republic Post Office, but turns out to be run by Stamp Regia as well. So I think this is actually a bogus or fake stamp. Here's another one uh, from the Central African Republic that's probably bogus or fake. And yet another bogus or fake souvenir sheet, uh, this time showing Henry Cavill and Amy Adams from the movie Man of Steel. Again, yet another bogus souvenir sheet, allegedly from Central African Republic, showing scenes from the movie Batman versus Superman. And yet another such souvenir sheet. Now you can see Wonder Woman making her appearance. And this has got to be the most bizarre fake item I've found. Um, for some reason, someone made a fake Wonder Woman cancel based on the from the based on the first day of issue cancellation for the Wonder Woman set from the United States. Now, this is the real cancellation for that Wonder Woman issue, but you'll see that the fake cancellation does not have the words first day of issue across the top, right? And somebody thought it was a good idea to put it on a cover show with a Supergirl stamp and a cachet showing Melissa Benoist as Supergirl, right? I have no reason why anyone would want to cancel a Supergirl stamp on a Supergirl cover with a fake Wonder Woman cancel, but someone did it and is offering it on Del Camp. Okay, every time I get one of these presentations, people ask me if I've ever met any of these celebrities in the movies, and indeed I have. So this is the first Lois Lane, No O'Neill, and I met her at the San Diego Comic Con in 2008, where she received a Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, this is Sarah Douglas, who played the Kryptonian villain, Ursa, in Superman and Superman 2. I saw her at Motor City Comic Con last year. And Jack O'Halloran, who played Ursa's sidekick, Non, another bad guy. Again, met him at Motor City Comic Con last year. Here's Clark Kent from the TV series Smallville. It's the actor Tom Welling, and I saw him at Ottawa Comic Con last year. And I'm cosplaying as the doctor from Doctor Who. And President Lex Luthor from the TV series Smallville. Here's Michael Rosenbaum at Fan Expo Canada in Toronto. And I'm cosplaying as the prisoner from the TV series, The Prisoner. And Supergirl from the TV series Smallville. Kara Zorel, played by Laura Vandervoort, who is Canadian. There she is with me at Fan Expo Canada. And Superman from Earth 96 or the movie Superman Returns. Uh, that's Brandon Routh, the actor. He also plays Ray Palmer, the Atom, on the TV series Legends of Tomorrow. And I also met Tyler Hoechlin, Superman from Earth 38, or the TV series Smallville, uh, also at Fan Expo Canada. Last year was a good year to meet Superman actors. I've also met a Superman comics writer, uh, this is Scott Edelman, a science fiction writer, and he used to work for Marvel Comics, but he moved over to DC in the 1970s. And he wrote two stories for Superman Family, a comic book about Superman's sidekicks. He wrote uh, 
to Supergirl Stories. And there's Scott and I at the World Science Fiction Convention in Dublin. We're, we're regulars at the World Science Fiction Convention. And he autographed the cover for me in Dublin. And there's the cover. Right. So uh, that's my presentation on Superman on Stamps. Uh, thanks for uh, listening. And I'll be able to take questions at this moment. Right.